Hello and welcome back to WePC. My name is Jay and in this video I'm going to show you how to overclock your Intel CPU. If this is your first time overclocking then it can seem a daunting and scary prospect but it's a relatively simple process that has thankfully been made somewhat easier by board manufacturers over the years. The benefits outweigh the effort as you will be able to squeeze out extra performance for gaming, productivity and general PC use at no extra cost. Firstly you should be aware of the risks involved. Overclocking is the act of running a processor at a higher clock speed than it was originally designed for. And by doing so, you are running it outside of the official Intel spec. This is not covered by warranty, the same is true for AMD, and any damages that may result from overclocking by following this guide are the responsibility of the end user. WePC is not liable for any damages that may occur as a result of following this guide, you have been warned. Secondly, more current may be required to keep the CPU stable at higher clock speeds, so you may need to increase the voltage, current, and resulting power passing through the processor. This obviously brings in its own set of issues, but passing more power through a semiconductor will result in higher thermals. Intel CPUs have safeguards in place to protect against overheating, such as thermal throttling, wherein the CPU downclocks itself and draws less power. Despite this, we would recommend temperatures no higher than about 85 degrees Celsius for a CPU for 24-7 use, and the lower, the better. Thirdly, how far you can overclock really does come down to a thing called the silicon lottery. Not all CPUs are the same, and despite sharing the same model number, you may find that one processor overclocks far better than the other. On the hardware side, there shouldn't be anything extra to purchase provided you have the following. An overclocking capable motherboard, such as one based on the Z490 chipset. We even reviewed the Meg Z490 Ace from MSI recently and found it to be exemplary. Be sure to check out our in-depth review to find out more. You will also need an unlocked Intel processor, which is denoted by the K suffix. For example, the Intel i7-10700 is a locked processor, but the i7-10700K is unlocked. As these unlocked processors do not come with coolers, you should have, or will need to get, a CPU cooler compatible with the LGA-1200 socket. In this video, we're going to be using the Fractal Design Celsius Plus S28 Dynamic, which has been excellent in cooling our overclock 10900K used in our benchmark test system. Before starting, you may want to run a benchmark like 3 Mark or even Cinebench so that you can see the performance gains of overclocking. And Anyway, with the warning and prerequisites established, let's take a look at the actual overclocking process. Some motherboards with factory defaults may remove power limits and this will be given various names depending on the manufacturer. With Asus, it's called Multicore Enhancement and MSI names it Enhanced Turbo. If your motherboard doesn't do this by default, then enabling it will give you a quick and crude overclock, but auto voltages will be higher than necessary and will result in one hot processor. So we always suggest overclocking manually. To start, we'll load the Extreme Memory Profile, or XMP for short. This allows the RAM to operate at the advertised frequency and timings by loading the stored memory profile. Some modules may have two profiles, usually labeled XMP1 and XMP2, and there may be a difference in frequency, timings, or neither. We suggest looking at the label on the memory module and loading the corresponding profile. Next, we want to remove those power limits we discussed earlier. We can do this on our Asus Tough Gaming Z490 Plus motherboard by setting Asus Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Now, a choice to make is whether you want to overclock on a per core level or not. Per core overclocking may allow you to reach higher frequencies on fewer cores, which can benefit lightly threaded games and applications. And an application would be a ratio of 53 on core 1, 52 on core 2, 51 on core 3, and so on. An easier and generally more beneficial approach is by syncing the ratio across all cores, and that's what we're going to do here. By setting CPU core ratio to sync all cores, we now set only one multiplier. Here, we are going to go with 47 for our 10900K, which will give us 4.7 gigahertz across all 10 cores. Once we've established this is stable at reasonable voltages, we will reset this setting and increase it by one each time. Whilst 47 might seem an arbitrary choice, we know from reading online and our own experience that the 10600K, 10700K and 10900K are all capable of this, so it's a safe enough starting point. With the CPU core ratio set, we can move up to the AVX offset setting. A value of 2 here would run all cores at 4.5 GHz, with our 47 core ratio under an AVX workload since 47 minus 2 is 45. You'll have to check thermals and stability for AVX workloads as they are far more intensive than traditional workloads and too high a clock speed may cause instability later down the line. As this is a negative offset, higher values reduce the core ratio. So a value of 3 would give you 4.4 GHz, which is 47 minus 3 
equals 44. CPU cache ratio is a new setting for temp gen Intel processors, and on our board, we have three relevant options. We generally recommend disabling ring down bin so that we can always observe the max ring ratio. Next, we set the minimum and maximum CPU cache ratio to 46. We've had little success going beyond 48 with this, and as we've mentioned, it will depend on your specific CPU, so this is something you'll definitely have to play with yourself. And that covers the most impactful settings regarding overclocking, but there are other options to look at heading over to the advanced tab and we can disable cores and even hyper threading. With Intel 10th gen of processors, we now have control of per core hyper threading. For those of you that want to take this further, it's something to experiment with, especially if you want higher single core frequencies, but honestly, we suggest leaving this as default. Still now under the advanced tab, there are also the familiar CPU power management control section. Leaving speed step, speed shift, and CPU C states at either auto or enabled will downclock the CPU when it isn't under much load, which results in less heat and save on energy cost. After all, there's little reason to have the CPU running at full speed, sucking up all that power when you're just browsing the internet. That being said, these technologies do tie in with the next section that we'll cover next. Heading back now to the AI Tweaker tab, and we'll take a look at the DigiPlus VRM. CPU load line calibration, or LLC, accounts for VDroop as a result of changing load. If you choose to leave those earlier power saving technologies enabled, then this setting will have a bigger impact than if you didn't. This setting really does depend on the motherboard manufacturer and maybe something you want to research yourself. Simplifying things, VDroop is voltage overshoot or undershoot when changing from idle to load and vice versa. LLC tries to smooth out these wild fluctuations that can lead to instability, and auto was fine for temperatures, so we stuck with that. But this is definitely something that you will want to configure if you're having issues with crashing when transitioning between workloads or thermals are a tad too high. Our final setting, CPU core slash cache voltage, or more commonly called vCore, is also intricately tied to LLC. There are usually four nodes to choose here. Auto, manual, offset, and adaptive. Auto is generally too generous, supplying a CPU with far more voltage than necessary, but it can be a good starting point to access your maximum clock speed. We'd recommend manual mode if you choose to disable the power saving features and want to run at a fixed frequency, since manual means you will also run at a fixed voltage. Overclocking this way is also far easier as there's less to contend with. VDroop is less of an issue. Offset can be set to either positive or negative with steps of a 0.005 voltage. This will then add or subtract that value from the default voltage controlled by the motherboard. We'd recommend this mode if you left the power saving features enabled, but it's another variable in overclocking that could cause instability. With everything set, all that's left to do is save the changes and exit, which can usually be done with the F10 key. If you're having issues booting into Windows or even booting at all, then CPU voltage is the likeliest culprit and will need raising with a higher vCore, lower offset or different LLC setting. If you can't get back into the BIOS, then you may have to remove the CMOS battery for a few minutes before reinserting it. This will reset all BIOS options, so make sure you have them written down or took pictures. Once in Windows, you'll want to perform stability checks. The general rule of thumb is that passing a one hour stress test in Primary 5 proves stability, though there are many different schools of thought. Some say 24 hours, some say that's too much, some prefer A to 64 or Linpack, but Prime 95 has been the go-to for the longest time, and in our testing has shown to be the more intensive than any other workload. Depending on how you configure Prime 95, you can create intense AVX2 workloads, and passing an hour's torture test is a good sign of stability, though it's debatable how representative of a real-world scenario this actually is. We found small FFTs to be the most demanding and produce the most heat, so it's our go-to. As we've already discussed, though, you could have an overclock fail this, but be perfectly stable for all other workloads, so it may be worth looking at one of the other torture tests if you prefer. Which Whichever you go with, the longer your system is stable for, generally the better, but an hour or so is usually enough. You'll also want to monitor thermals during this process. HW Info is a great option as it offers real-time monitoring in addition to the min and max on a plethora of voltages, thermal probes, and even frequency. There's also the ability to record these values to a file which you can then graph. To start, run HW Info in sensors-only mode and then scroll down a bit to the CPU section littered with thermometers. Here you want to pay attention to the CPU package, both the current value and maximum. Ideally, this should be under 90 degrees Celsius, but AVX workloads are extremely power demanding, so it's not crazy to see 100 degrees Celsius, even with a good AIO. If temperatures look reasonable, then leave it for an hour and come back to see the maximum temperature CPU package reached. It may also be worth scrolling down to the motherboard section and taking a note of the maximum vCore that was required. Though do be aware motherboard software voltage readouts aren't known for being accurate, so only use this value as a guide. No matter the outcome, you will need to revisit the BIOS. If temperatures were higher than you'd like, then your only solution outside of upgrading your cooler is to reduce the voltage. Primarily, this is the vCore and should be reduced accordingly to the voltage mode you've set. The 
the second option is reducing load line calibration, we suggest only adjusting one thing at a time and only in small steps. If the system crashed, then you will still want to do the opposite, increase vCore and or load line calibration. If you pass the torture test, then you may want to increase your overclock, and you can do this by increasing the CPU core ratio value by one step. You can also experiment with increasing CPU cache ratio and even reducing the AVX negative offset, but we'd recommend changing one thing at a time. Irrelevant of the outcome, you'll want to repeat the torch test and make the appropriate adjustments based on our previous recommendation. Once you are finally happy with your overclock and thermals, be sure to take a note of the settings for future reference. At this point, you can run the benchmark you ran earlier and compare scores to see the fruits of your labor. And that concludes our guide on overclocking an Intel CPU. As you saw, it's not much more than trial and error, though it can be extremely tedious. The performance gain can be tangible and had for free, requiring nothing more than your time. We hope this overclocking guide has been helpful to you, and please let us know what overclocks you were able to achieve down in the comments below. As always, we would love if you could leave a like on the video, subscribe to your news channel, hit the notification bell so you never miss an upload, and if you click over here, this will take you to another one of our videos. It'd be great if you could go and check that out, and we'll see you in the next one.